Martin and I'm just going to introduce him. So yes, yeah, 71% haven't been to, I'm sure you would have heard of him though. I mean, his global community, it says he has 20,000 people connecting over 160 countries. Um, he now focuses on this conversational leadership, which he's going to share um, a bit more about this morning. Um, but where I met him was, I think, 2002, David, 2003, um, at a London Knowledge um, Network, and we did a cafe around that event. And I've benefited so much over the years um, from his newsletters, from all his insights. Um, and I, you know, I hope you will um, we'll send a link to his site so you can follow his blog afterwards. And, and I'm sure you're all going to get great benefit from it. So over to you, David. Take it away. Okay, a big thank you, Nancy. I remember the cafe we did at Bourneville. Yes, at um, Cadbury. That, again, 2002, 2003, I should have looked it up. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a little disappointed I'm not um, joining you all in person at, uh, um, at Warwick. Um, I mentioned to Nancy earlier that uh, the last time I was at Warwick University was 1969. I'm showing my age here. I was a student and I had gone to a folk club to watch Al Stewart. Those of you who might know the, uh, the, English, uh, the English folk singer. But, uh, that's uh, the distant past. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna talk for about 20 minutes, and then we're gonna do a mini knowledge cafe. For those of you who are not familiar with the cafe, you'll get to experience it a little. And um, it's not a full cafe, um, but I'll explain more about that at the, uh, at the time. <clears throat> Now, when we think about innovation, the root of innovation, if you will, is good ideas. If we've got some good ideas, then we're in with a chance at uh, innovating. And some of you may remember this book from Stephen Johnson, I think from about 10 years ago, where good ideas come from. And he did a TED talk as well at the time. And what I want to do to kick off with and share two little video clips of you, Stephen, talking about where good ideas come from. The first clip's probably about four minutes, so it's a little long. Um, but uh, I, th I think you'll, you, I hope you'll rather like it, especially if you haven't seen it before. And I've seen it many times, and I still draw a lot of inspiration from it. And then the second one is a little bit shorter, and it talks about the, um, the London coffee houses of the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, which I think is really quite a fascinating topic. So let's kick off and uh, share this first video with you. For the past five years, I've been investigating this question of where good ideas come from. It's a kind of problem I think all of us are intrinsically interested in. We want to be more creative, we want to come up with better ideas, we want our organizations to be more innovative. I've looked at this problem from an environmental perspective. What are the spaces that have historically led to unusual rates of creativity and innovation? And what I've found in all of these systems, there are these recurring patterns that you see again and again that are crucial to creating environments that are unusually innovative. One pattern I call the slow hunch that breakthrough ideas almost never come in a moment of great insight, in a sudden stroke of inspiration. Most important ideas take a long time to evolve, and they spend a long time dormant in the background. It isn't until the idea has had two or three years, sometimes 10 or 20 years, to mature that it suddenly becomes accessible to you and useful to you in a certain way. And this is partially because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller hunches, so that they form something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the history of innovation, cases of, of someone who has half of an idea. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. This is a project that Berners-Lee worked on for 10 years. But when he started, he didn't have a full vision for this new medium he was going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years did the full vision of the World Wide Web come into being. That is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate, and they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. 
And you have to figure out a way to create systems that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than the sum of their parts. That's why, for instance, the coffee house in the Age of the Enlightenment or the Parisian salons of, of modernism were such engines of creativity because they created a space where ideas could mingle and swap and create new forms. When you look at the problem of innovation from this perspective, it sheds a lot of important light on the debate we've been having recently about what the internet is doing to our brains. Are we getting overwhelmed with an always connected multitasking lifestyle? And is that going to lead to less sophisticated thoughts as we move away from the slower, deeper, contemplative state of reading, for instance? Obviously, I'm a big fan of reading. But I think it's important to remember that the great driver of scientific innovation and technological innovation has been the historic increase in connectivity and our ability to reach out and exchange ideas with other people and to borrow other people's hunches and combine them with our hunches and turn them into something new. That really has, I think, been, more than anything else, the primary engine of creativity and innovation over the last 600 or 700 years. And so, yes, it's true we're more distracted. But what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we're working on or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information that we can use to build and improve our own ideas. That's the real lesson of where good ideas come from, that chance favors the connected mind. I love that, um, <clears throat> that term, that phrase, chance favors the connected mind. But just um, reflecting on what Stephen had to say there, I mean, the, the first point is that we need to create spaces where ideas can mingle and swap and create new forms. I think that's uh, uh, the key message. Um, and it's conversation. Um, not too surprising, I would uh, agree with uh, Stephen here. It's conversation that leads from knowledge to innovation. Um, but as I said earlier, what particularly fascinates me is the, is the birth and the growth and the impact of the London coffee houses in the 17th and 18th century. And I just want to share with you now um, just a much shorter video clip from Stephen talking about uh, those coffee houses. So Priestley had this problem where he couldn't get access to, he didn't have the information networks that he needed. And so he got an introduction um, to Benjamin Franklin and goes to London and meets Franklin in a coffee house, the London coffee house, um, and pitches him on this idea for this, this book about electricity that he wants to write. Now, the coffee house culture is crucial to this story as well. Um, in, on, on two levels. First, the information networks of the day, the coffee house was a great hub of Enlightenment era culture. People would come into the coffee house, they would hang out, they would share ideas, they would come from different disciplines. A whole number of crucial events in the history of Enlightenment culture have a coffee house somewhere in them one way or another. The whole insurance business is invented in Lloyd's Coffee House, which becomes Lloyd's of London. Um, and so Franklin had this group called the Club of Honest Whigs that would get together and they would hang out and they would talk about electricity and they would talk about chemistry and they would talk about politics and they would talk about religion. And it was really this crucial kind of hub in, this, in this, the information networks of the time. The other important part about the coffee house was the coffee, right? Because until coffee and tea became kind of mainstream beverages in the 18th century, the daytime beverage of choice for, the, for the, both the mass and elites in, in British society was alcohol for health reasons, right? Because you would, the water just wasn't safe to drink. And so you had an entire culture that was waking up in the morning and drinking two pints of beer and then, you know, going to work and then having a little bit more beer and then having a little wine and then having a little gin, particularly in the 1600s, and then having a little bit more wine, a little bit more beer. So the entire culture basically was drunk all day long <laughs> as a kind of default state, right? And so it's not an accident. I mean, it sounds like a joke. It sounds like something you drink, somebody who drinks a lot of coffee would say. But it's not an accident that the age of re reason accompanies the rise of caffeinated beverages. Because think about what your life would be like if you switch from drinking two pints of beer in the morning to drinking two cups of coffee. I know some of you do drink two pints of beer in the morning. And I, and I think I know which one's there. Um, <laughs> So you're going, to have, you're going to be sharper, you're going to be more productive. The culture is moving from a depressant to a stimulant. And the, there's going to be results kind of rippling through the culture in that way. So, so the coffee house is part of the story of why was Priestley 
able to do what he did at that point. So has anybody had two pints of beer this morning? I'm sure a few of you had, uh, had two cups of coffee. No, not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not, not yet. Let's, um, I said, I, I want to just talk a little bit more about the coffee houses because I find them absolutely uh, fascinating. So we're going to travel back in, back in time, back um, to uh, the, the 17th century. And, and this is a drawing of a typical um, so-called Enlightenment coffee house. Um, it was only men that um, took part or you know, joined these coffee houses. And it seems that no reputable woman would be seen dead in a coffee house. I'm, I'm not sure exactly, exactly why. Um, but um, one of the other names, they were called Penny Universities. And you could pay a penny for your coffee. And it seems the coffee of the day was, was pretty foul. Um, but as Stephen explained, it, um, it, uh, it kept them sober. And th they talked about issues of the day, be it politics, uh, be it business, be it whatever. Um, and my, my wife works in the city, um, really not far from where the first coffee houses, just a few minutes walk from where the first coffee houses uh, started. And uh, I've been on a little coffee house tour. You can go and visit the, um, uh, the locations of these old coffee houses. But the very first coffee house was at St. Michael Cornhill. And these are photographs that I took of the church uh, just a few years ago. And running down the side of the church is St. Michael's Alley. And this was where the very first coffee house in England started back in 1652. So going back a little way. Um, but they took off very, very rapidly. Within 10 years, there were 80 coffee houses within the city walls. I think uh, some of the city walls were still standing then. But by the 18th century, um, there were over 500 coffee houses. I think in the city of London alone, although maybe that could be um, larger London, because that does seem rather a large number of uh, coffee houses just for the city. But this is what was passed. Well, well, first of all, there were a lot of coffee houses. Um, Stephen mentioned uh, Lloyd's, uh, Lloyd's Coffee House, um, that was uh, the root of Lloyd's of London. And um, Jonathan's Coffee House was uh, the root of the London Stock Exchange. Um, but you can, you can go and visit the city and uh, discover where these uh, coffee houses once stood. I think Lloyd's Coffee House is now a same place. So. Things have changed a little bit in uh, four or five hundred years. But this is the interesting thing about the coffee houses. First of all, maybe today we would call them communities of interest. The coffee houses in the city catered for merchants, for bankers, um, for sea captains. Um, this is how Lloyds of London started in some ways. And it, it was about um, uh, ensuring the, uh, you know, the, the sailing ships that were that, you know, were heading to the East Indies to bring that spices and 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 what have you. So you know, th this was all about um, uh, all about finance. Uh, the coffee houses around the Strand and the, and the law courts were for lawyers, Covent Garden for actors, and uh, Westminster and St James for politicians. So so these these coffee houses were communities of interest. And uh, you know, there were a few well-known institutions that have survived to this day, and including Lloyds of London, the Royal Society, London Stock Exchange, um, and the, um, the auction houses of Sotheby's and Christie's, interestingly, also started in the coffee houses. So they really were engines of, of, of innovation. Now, about 50 years or so later, 60 years or so later, across the Atlantic, um, we had Benjamin Franklin in, uh, in Philadelphia. 1727, and what Benjamin Franklin did, he, he created something that he called the Junto Club. And I guess he never used the term, but he clearly knew something about cognitive diversity because his initial club had 12 members from diverse backgrounds. as a mathematician, a surveyor, and a merchant, and uh, interestingly, a runaway student from Oxford. I've got no idea who, who he might have been, but they were clearly um, a diverse bunch of, uh, bunch of people. Um, and to join this club, 
it's, it's, it's a conversational society as it says here to improve themselves and their community to join this club they had to make five pledges and these these are the pledges that uh, they they had to make and i particularly like these uh, pledges um i'll just give you a moment to to read them and you can see why this was really quite creative on benjamin franklin's part but the one i like the most is the very last one do you love truth's sake and will you endeavor impartially to find and receive it yourself and communicate it to others this is certainly about knowledge management is it not and clearly the answer to that pledge is uh, is yes but to provoke the conversations um, in his conversational club he had 24 questions and I, I don't want to go through each one of them now but i just uh, put a few of them up on on slides that you can just take a look at just browse to get a feel for the sorts of conversations that he was trying to uh, trying to convene trying to provoke and i'll just let you browse those questions there I hope you find these as, as fascinating as I do, and especially the, the language of the time. Maybe read one each, the one that you bold, put in bold, I'm, David. I'm, I'm about the, to do that, Nancy. Yeah. yeah. Just for the lady um, that couldn't. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, the, the ones in bold I, I, I plan to read. Oh, so it's, you. do you know of any deserving young beginner, lately set up, whom it lies in the power of the Junto, any way to encourage? Um, that, that's my favorite amongst those four. You can, as you should consider them, you can, you can pick your favorite. Um, he was also into storytelling. What new story have you lately heard agreeable for telling in conversation? Uh, I, hope, I hope those were sort of, uh, I hope they were sharing ideas and sharing knowledge there and not, uh, and not gossiping. But I'm, I'm sure there was some gossip. Also interesting about the Junto Club. It wasn't just about business, history, morality, poetry, physics, travels, and uh, or other parts of knowledge. I, I love the, the language of the time. And uh, just a few more. And again, here I, I particularly like the last question. Um, I say this this guy truly was an early. Uh, knowledge manager. Do you see anything amiss in the present customs or proceedings of the Junto which might be amended? I don't know about you, I just love it. So this was uh, this was the Junto Club. Now a little bit like the London coffee houses, a tremendous amount of innovation came out of this club. The f you can see here on the plan the first truly volunteer fire company in the US was one of the products of the Junto Club. And that fire company formed the model for, for many other fire companies across the United States at the time. So that, that's quite fascinating in itself and the University of Pennsylvania and a few others. But the other one that's interesting is the first lending library. It seems in those days, uh, books were very expensive they were shipped in from, uh, from, from London. Uh, very few people could afford books. Some of the members of the club had the, uh, the wherewithal to afford the books, you know, such as Franklin himself. And uh, they created a room in one of their houses where they pulled all their books, they shared all their books. And uh, that went on to be the first lending library in the world, uh, the Library Company of Philadelphia. So again, just some absolute fascinating history here. And it all came from a conversation. That's, that's what I love about this. So the, just drawing, if you like, to the close of uh, my presentation and uh, some conversation around this. Where do good ideas come from? 
And for me, the key message is that you don't need any fancy tools. You don't need sophisticated techniques. Yes, maybe at times in some situations they will help. I'm not saying you don't need them. But to, to do this sort of thing, you don't really need much money. You need very little in resource. And you know, I very much like um, what Stephen says. You just need to create spaces where ideas can mingle and swap and create new forms. And the Junto Club, I think, is a tremendous example of that. Um, I've got a modified version of my knowledge cafe uh, that I call an innovation cafe, which is, which is also a, a, a conversational cafe. So my, my message to you, if you like, is seize the day. Just do it. Um, any, any one of you, if you choose to, could start your own innovation cafe or your own Junto Club. And if you're interested in doing that, first of all, again, as some of you know, I've been writing a book, an online book. I call it a book because it's a cross between a blog and a conventional book um, online on something I call conversational leadership. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, uh, fundamentally at, uh, at, uh, at conversation and uh, leadership as a, as a practice rather than a position of authority. And I've written a lot there. Well, everything I've talked about you will find in that book. And uh, Nancy's going to share these slides with you. Um, these links just, just point you to um, more information on, on everything that I've talked about. But let's, um, let's run a little mini knowledge cafe because we have now about, what, 40 minutes to do that. So what I'm going to do in a moment, I'm going to give you a question to think about. I'm then going to break you out into breakout groups of about three, three or four people per group. I'm yeah, I would do four in case anyone drops out. Um, yep, yep, no, I'll, I'll do four, Nancy. Okay, um, so I will do four. Um, and uh, we're going to have two rounds of conversation, maybe about 12 minutes each. And then we'll come back together for hopefully a good 15 minutes. Uh, conversation where we can share our thoughts and ideas in the in the whole group. So I hope that makes sense. Um, this is this is the question. Um, be a rather obvious one, given what I just uh, just said. Do you feel inspired to start your own junto club or something similar? Yeah, it's it's not that difficult to do. In fact, it's very easy to do, and you can do it very easily over Zoom. And uh, you know. You don't even need 12 people, half a dozen people, half a dozen um, creative friends that you could uh, bring together, either within your organization or across organizations. And if you do feel inspired, um, how, where, when? And if not, you know, if you've got problems with this, issues with this, why not? What's, what's the problem with it? What don't you like about it? M maybe what limitations do you see or what limitations do you feel um, you know, are holding you back? Okay, so that's the question. Let me break out of the presentation. Uh, stop share. Okay. Me and Michael were saying that um, our informal group is our little Junto club. So those of you that know the KCN, and maybe for Kin, it's the little steering groups, isn't it, Erica? Would you think that the, if the broad network has then disperse into smaller groups and they have sessions on virtual teams on communities yeah. yeah i was thinking exactly the same that whilst kin was set up as a formal group and um, we have breakaway groups within that yeah because people have interests and uh, they naturally gather together and talk to each other without requiring formal organization so exactly that and uh, i know david you've come and uh, worked with us and, and run kind of cafes with people from the kin group as well so you know we we've taken part in those kind of things yeah i, I think they happen all the time we just don't realize the power of them i think that's part of the issue no i think you're absolutely right i mean i don't do gender clubs i mean i do my large cafes all over the place but i've got actually it's four people now that I, I regularly meet up on Zoom one-to-one. -one. Not quite the same, but we're talking about topics that we're passionate about. And, and that's, the only, um, that's the only criteria. We're not designing anything or building anything. We 
We're talking about knowledge management, we're talking about innovation, we're talking about conversation, we're talking about all sorts of things. Um, but it's, it's just getting those ideas, um, mingling and mingling and swapping, as uh, Stephen said. So, okay, I am about to create, let's see. Uh, Any problems anyone feels, you can log back in and David will be in the main oh, room. Oh, yes, I, I get left behind here. <laughs> There's usually somebody who also gets left behind. So I'm creating 13 breakout rooms, so there should be between four and five people per room. So let's just take a look. And if you start by introducing yourself in the small group and then answering the question, that would be great. I want you to get to know each other. I'm just looking just to see whether how good a job Zoom has done. It's done a pretty good job. I'm sending you off to your breakout rooms. See you shortly. Yeah, I'll still be here. Well, I hope I am. 